Okay, uh, let's begin. So this morning I told you how we could get many body localization with long range interactions in a one dimensional model, QED one plus one. Uh, now let's move away from one dimension bearing in mind that everything I say will be up to avalanches in rare regions. Uh, so, you know, 1D is special. Can we get localization with long range interactions in higher dimensions? Yes. And one way to do it is to use superconductivity and the Higgs mechanism. Uh, so, you know, note that there is no tension between superconductivity, which is ultimately a property of the ground state, and localization, which is about what the excitations are doing. You can't have such a thing as a localized superconductor, it superconducts for charge, it's an insulator for heat. Uh, you can just, we can demonstrate this crisply for a, for a system that lives in true two dimensions with an electric field that also lives in two dimensions. So now the potential is log r. So if you like, this is QED two plus one at non-zero density. Uh, so uh, no, the important thing is that the interaction is the Gauss's law interaction. So log r in two dimensions is the interaction that you would get for a Gauss's law. And Gauss's law interactions are special because you can always trade a Gauss's law interaction for a local Hamiltonian with a gauge constraint, right? You can always think of a Gauss's law interaction as being mediated by a gauge field and the coupling to the gauge field is local. Uh, no, this is... So now you could ask that, well, you know, Burin claims that there is this obstruction to constructing locator expansions with long range interactions. Have you got around that obstruction completely? Uh, and the answer is no, we haven't got around the obstruction completely. Uh, well, okay, let me first discuss the idea that you know, if you decouple the long range interaction with a gauge field, and then the superconductor is the Higgs phase of the gauge field, and there's three types of excitations, the quasi-particles, the vortices, and the plasmons. Uh, the quasi-particles and vortices are together described by uh, Ising gauge theory, basically toric code with matter. Uh, that's localizable, that's something we showed in 2013. The key question is, can we localize the gauge fields? Uh, and in the absence of superconductivity, the gauge field actually has an obstruction to localization at low energies, which is very similar to the obstruction to localization of the Goldstone modes. Uh, this is something Gorari and Choker pointed out in 2003. Uh, the localization length of the gauge field modes diverges at low frequency, and this smuggles Burin physics back in, in through the back door. You still can't construct a locator expansion. But when you haze the gauge field, and you know, as Anderson realized, the you know, superconductor is a Higgs phase of matter. When you Higgs the gauge field, it removes the obstruction uh, to localizing the gauge field, just like it removes the long range interaction. Uh, and now you can do you know, soft consistent perturbation theory in disorder, and you discover that all the gauge modes are localized with bounded localization length in all dimensions less than four. Uh, there's a you know, cute scaling argument you can make, which is an ad adaptation of the arguments of Gerari and Choker where you take the dispersion relation for the gauge field with a mass term coming from the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, 
you average it over one wavelength and you get something that looks like that. Uh, and now you set Q equal to uh, the uh, localization length and you get a scaling for the localization length which goes like this and you can see that in any dimension less than four, uh, you know, M naught is the typical size of the Higgs mass. This is finite, you know, well behaved. As D goes to zero, four, you know, things break down but uh, I don't have to apologize for not talking about systems in dimensions four and higher. This is a kinesis matter summer school. Uh, okay, so the conclusion is that you know, it, for, uh, for QED two plus one at finite density, you know, fermions in two dimensions with log R interactions, all <coughs> sectors can be localized, quasi-particle Borchak's gauge field, the interactions are purely short range and this system is therefore many body localizable, so there should exist such things as two dimensional superconductors. But of course, real physical superconductors don't exist in two dimensions, they exist in three dimensions. So what happens if we try and do, uh, if we try and work in three dimensions? Again, I want to use a Gauss's law interaction. Uh, Gauss's law interactions are special. They allow me to trade the long range interaction for a short range interaction with a gauge constraint. Uh, the Gauss's law interaction in 3D is one over R. That's great, that's real Coulomb. Okay. So I'll consider fermions in three dimensions with a real Coulomb interaction one over R. Uh, if I work in continuous space, I have a problem because I already mentioned that continuous space in three dimensions, there's no locator expansion. Uh, I want to tackle one problem at a time. I don't want to tackle the continuous space problem right now. So I'll just put everything on a lattice. I have fermions on a three dimensional lattice with a one over R interaction uh, and just deal with the long range interaction problem. I can still trade the long range interaction for a gauge field on the lattice I can Higgs the gauge field, I can repeat the analysis from two dimensions. It still follows that the quasi-particles in the gauge field can be localized. But now the vortices are tricky because in three dimensions, vortices are line-like excitations. And the whole framework of localization is built around localizing point-like excitations. So can we localize vortices in three dimensions? Well, yes we can. Uh, the basic idea is that, well, if you have a small vortex loop, you can coarse grain and it looks like a point. So that's not a problem. The real problem is with long vortex lines. Uh, and how does a long vortex line move? Well, you could imagine it moving uniformly, but that's problematic for two reasons. Firstly, in order to move a long vortex line in a uniform manner, you need to act on it with a very non-local operator. And my Hamiltonian is only allowed to have local things in it. But secondly, if I'm really in a random potential, then you move a vortex line in a random potential, it'll go off energy shell by a huge amount. Right, each part of the vortex line will go off energy shell by some random amount and the whole line will go off energy shell by an amount of order square root L. So vortices can't move uniformly. The way they would actually move is you make a little kink in the vortex and you sweep the kink down the line and now you've moved the whole vortex across. So the motion of vortices can be turned into the motion of kinks down the vortex line. And now that you've done this, kinks are interacting point-like objects. So now we back in on familiar ground and we can start to use standard uh, locator type arguments. And what you can show is you can actually map the problem of a single vortex moving in three dimensions to a many body localization problem of point like kinks moving in one dimension up and down the vortex line. And you can formalize it both by locator expansion and by some strong disorder RG approaches and you can convince yourself that for strong enough disorder a single vortex line moving in three dimensions can be localized. Now what if you have many vortex lines? Well, you know, if you think of, uh, if you take many localized systems and you couple them together, then for sufficiently weak coupling, you should still have a localized system up to concerns about avalanches and rare regions, which I already declared I was not going to worry about. So in fact, it should be the case that, you know, up to rare regions, there should be such, you know, there should be a phase in three dimensions where you can localize extended objects like you know, vortex lines and even higher dimensional objects because you just, Motion of membranes can be reduced to the motion of lines, the motion of lines can be reduced to the motion of points, points can be localized. So if I now come back to my motivating problem, which was fermions on a three-dimensional lattice with a one over R interaction, I go into the superconducting phase, I have Ising gauge theory uh, in three dimensions. Uh, you know, Ising gauge theory now contains line-like objects, but the line-like objects can be localized. So there should be such a phase as a localized superconductor on the three-dimensional lattice. I cheated a little bit because I put the gauge field in the lattice and the real gauge field certainly lives in the continuum. Uh, but no, I also cheated because I ignored uh, 
rare region effects, but at least we can get around the long-range interaction. The long-range interaction itself is not an insuperable problem. And, you know, there should be such a thing as a many-body localized superconductor in three dimensions up to whatever corrections come from the system really being a continuum system and not a lattice system, and whatever corrections come from uh, you know, rare regions. What should its phenomenology be? Well, it should be a, you know, it should be a superconductor, uh, but it should be a thermal insulator. Uh, so it's like the Vortex glass phase, which superconductivity aficionados may have heard about, but the Vortex glass phase is a thermodynamic phase, it's an equilibrium, vortices are pinned. This is a localized phase, it's nonlinear response properties are different, it's AC conductivity is different. So you no, know, it's reminiscent of the Vortex glass, but it's not the same thing. So the conclusions to this part of the work are that long-range interacting systems can be localized. The key ingredient is strong interactions which drive the system into a correlated phase, and this correlated phase is best described in terms of generation excitations, which can be short-range interacting and localized in the usual manner. We demonstrated it with two examples, the confining phase, QED 1 plus 1, and also a Higgs phase superconductors in two and three dimensions. Uh, this may actually be useful. It might allow you to use disorder to stabilize superconductivity to energy densities where it wouldn't arise in thermal equilibrium. And as a corollary of this, it follows that extended objects can also be localized. So this is work done with Shivaji and Michael. Uh, but you know, those of you that uh, you know, were really paying attention would now be complaining. And what you would be complaining about is that I promised you I was going to show you how to get localization without locator expansions. And that's not really what I did. Because all I did is I set up a locator expansion, but about a non-trivial fixed point. Instead of doing locator expansion about the free fermion fixed point, which doesn't work, blur ensured that. Instead, I found some interacting correlated fixed point about which I could do a locator expansion. Okay, it's somewhat non-trivial. It's beyond Burin, but it's not beyond locator expansion. Okay. So next, I'm going to move on to how to get beyond locator expansions entirely. But before I get on to that, are there any questions? Yeah. So if so normally your system has a, a state where it condenses at zero temperature, but uh -huh. it doesn't mean your condensate exists at high temperature or high energy. Well, so you could imagine excited states as being constructed by starting from the ground state and then making some number of excitations. So the ground state still contains a condensate, but the excitations are all localized. Remember, remember localization is a property of excitations. It's not a property of the ground state. And if, I, if you ask me, is the ground state localized, it's not a meaningful question. Is there a certain number of excitations where when you add another excitation, it's meaningless because you've destroyed the condensate? Ah, OK. So uh, all of these arguments, they're ultimately based on arguments of the Basco Lehner Altschuler form, you know, perturbative constructions of locator expansion. Uh, and those are only valid at energy densities that are low but not zero. So if you push to high enough energy densities, high enough temperatures, then this argument will necessarily fail. How to interpret that, I don't know. But, uh, but this is a statement about low temperature localization, low but non-zero temperature localization. Uh, and now, you know, of course, there's rare region arguments that say that localization is all or nothing. Either it's there at all temperatures or none. But I already said I wasn't worrying about rare regions. Okay. So there may be corrections at some very long time scale that come from rare hot regions uh, you know, running around in the sample. I don't know. You know. I'm just dealing with one problem at a time. And uh, today's task is the long range interaction. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so now let's you know, see how we can maybe go beyond locator expansions altogether. But before we can talk about that, I need to take a detour. Uh, and the detour is into a field called fractons. Uh, you may have heard something about fractons. Uh, we actually wrote a review about it. So if you want to know everything about fractons that I knew as of March, that's where you go to look. Uh, and, you know, this is a new field of matter. There is you know, new papers. Uh, this is a new field of condensed matter. There's new papers and fractons coming out every week. Uh, and the reason I got into fractons is because they're interesting playgrounds for dynamics. And I will show you how we can use 
ideas from fractons to get new insights into many body localization beyond locator expansions. Uh, but first I have to tell you what fractons are, right? Uh, so let's introduce what fractons are. I'll do this, uh, so this last lecture will be structured. Uh, yeah, an hour should be perfect. It will be structured in the following way. I'll start by explaining what fractons are. Uh, I'll then start by discussing fracton dynamics in a locator-ish approach. And then finally, I'll talk about fracton dynamics beyond locator expansions. So what are fractons? Well, these are new phases of quantum matter originally in three space dimensions, although now we know they can exist in two space dimensions also. Uh, whether they can exist in one dimension is still an open question. The key property of fractons is that the excitations exhibit fractionalized mobility. Either they're completely immobile or they're only able to move in certain directions. But it's fractionalized because if you take multiple elementary excitations and put them together, then you have a composite excitation which is fully mobile and able to move freely. There's additional properties regarding ground state degeneracy when the system is gapped. So just a lightning history lesson, the first fracton model was written down by Clyde Shimon in 2005. Uh, subsequent work by Castelnova and Shimon and Bravi, people didn't really pay much attention up until Zhang Wan Ha wrote a seminal paper in 2011. Still the people who paid attention were only in quantum information uh, and condensed matter people didn't start to pay attention until a handful of papers in 2015 and 2016 by folk at MIT. Uh, including Michael Pretko, who wrote a beautiful you know, series of single author papers. Uh, Michael's now a postdoc at Boulder. Uh, and subsequently, in the past 18 months, there's been a complete explosion of you know, work on the fracture front. I think this reference list was roughly complete as of March, but you know, if I was to do it as of today, it would go off the bottom of the board. Uh, so, okay, there's lots of activity on fractons, but I still haven't really told you what they are. And it's easiest to explain what they are by example. And the easiest example which illustrates what fractons are all about is a model called the X-cube introduced by Vijay Ha and Fu. Uh, actually first introduced by Castelnova and Shimon, but buried in Appendix D uh, and then rediscovered by Vijay Ha and Fu. Uh, okay, so this is the X-cube model. Uh, the Hamiltonian takes the following form and you can add arbitrary local perturbations if you want. This is a highly symbolic form of the Hamiltonian. It contains two sorts of operators, A's and B's. The A's are product, so I should say, it's a model of spin halves which live on the links of a cubic lattice. Yeah, Mike. Uh, uh, sorry, I should ask this one slide here since the interruption, but you said, what is the model we know in 2D? Is there actually a lattice model? Elast uh, no, there's no lattice model, but there are Elast field theories. Yeah. Okay. So it still could be that there's no 2D fracton lattice model. It's entirely possible that there is no stabilizer code. In fact, it's generally believed that there is no stabilizer code exhibiting fraction properties in two dimensions. It's definitely no CS. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, no. Well, it could be that there's a lattice model, it's just not exactly solvable. Right. Yeah, yeah, no CS. Yeah. But also, it also could be that just no lattice model. Well, elasticity should have a lattice model, right? Yeah. Melt, right? Well, okay, yeah, quasi long range order in two dimensions. Yeah. Uh, there's field theories which have fractal order in two dimensions. Uh, okay, so two sorts of terms, A's and B's. Uh, A, so spin halves, which live on the links of a cubic lattice. The A term is a product of all sigma x's around you know, the 12 links that frame an elementary cube. The B's is a product of four sigma Z's. So you pick a vertex, there are six links coming out of each vertex. You further pick a plane, either the X, Y, Y, Z, or X, Z planes. Now there are four links coming out of a vertex in that particular plane. And you take the product of sigma Z's over those four links, and that's a B operator. And the Hamiltonian is a sum over all possible cube operators and all possible star operators. It's a stabilizer code. Uh, in fact, what you can see is that these operators all commute with each other. So z's commute with z's, that's trivial. x's commute with x's, that's trivial. Uh, if you look at any a or and any b operator, they always share an even number of spins. So even though x and z individually don't commute, if you have an even number of spins in common, the b's and a's do commute. So all these operators commute. If you square them, they square to one. So their eigenvalues are plus minus one. Uh, and elementary counting with open boundary conditions tells you there's as many 
know, of these operators as there are qubits in the system. So you can label the eigenstates by the eigenvalues under these stabilizers. If you do periodic boundary conditions, you cannot uniquely label the eigenstates, then there's some residual degeneracy. But with open boundary conditions, you can. Uh, Gram state is you make all the operators happy. Uh, you know, on a torus, there's a huge degeneracy. So log of the degeneracy is linear in system size. Uh, on open boundary conditions, it goes away. Uh, I don't care so much about the ground state degeneracy. What I care about is the dynamics of the excitations. So what are the excitations of the X cubed model? Well, uh, you could act, you could imagine acting, let's say, with a single Z operator on a single link, right? That will commute with the B terms, which are made of Zs. It will anti-commute with A terms, which are made of Xs, right? Remember, the A terms are product of all Xs around a cube. So every single cube that contains this link, it'll anti-commute with the A term on those cubes. So it'll anti-commute with the A terms here, 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 here. It'll make those cubes unhappy as far as the A terms are concerned. Act with a single sigma z, and you get four unhappy cube excitations. Uh, now let's act with another sigma z. So now I've anti-commuted once with these two cubes. These are unhappy. These cubes in the middle, anti-commute once, anti-commute again. Again, you make them unhappy and then happy again. These other two cubes here, those are unhappy also. So if I act with two sigma z's, I'll get two unhappy cubes here and two unhappy cubes there. Now let's imagine acting with a membrane of sigma z operators everywhere here. Every cube in the interior of the membrane gets flipped four times. You multiply by minus one to the four, it's still one. Every cube along the edges gets flipped two times. Minus one squared, still one. Every cube on the corner is flipped just once. So if you act with a membrane of sigma z's, you end up with four unhappy cube excitations on the four corners of the membrane. So now I've acted with no, this membrane of sigma z's. I have unhappy cubes at the four membranes. And these unhappy cubes I'll call my elementary excitations. How do I move these? Well, I could act with sigma z here, but that, well, that would make this cube happy again, but now it would create three unhappy cubes, right? So it will create additional excitations. There is no local operator which can move a single one of these excitations without creating additional excitations. The only way to do it is to expand or contract this whole membrane, and that's a very non-local operation. So, these elementary excitations, these isolated unhappy cubes, are immobile under local perturbations or under local Hamiltonian dynamics. Now, if you have four unhappy cubes together, that can be locally created or destroyed. So that's an excitation that's fully mobile. It can be moved around freely. But a single unhappy cube is immobile under local perturbations. So that's the sense in which this model has fractionalized excitations. It also has subdimensional excitations, so if you have two unhappy cubes that can move freely in this direction or in, uh, yeah, in this direction or in that direction, but they cannot move freely in the skinny direction. You can verify that also uh, by thinking about acting with local operators on this system. X cube is the simplest model. Uh, Haas code is a richer, more complicated model, uh, which I won't really go into. It's also defined on the cubic lattice, again involves uh, terms made out of Pauli's, X's and Z's. Now there's two qubits which live on every vertex of the lattice. Uh, no, these terms still commute. It's still exactly solvable, but the behavior is weirder. Uh, the remarkable thing is that it's still true that individual unhappy cubes cannot be moved by any local operator. And if you try and move a single unhappy cube, the energy penalty you pay actually grows with how far you move. It grows as log r. So there's a growing energy barrier to moving fractals. So just a quick overview. Uh, no. Key property of fractals is that the excitations have fractionalized mobility. They're created by non-local operators. And once you've made them, they can't be moved by any local operators. And in the X cube model, every time you move an excitation, you pay a constant energy penalty. Uh, you know, two excitations. That's characteristic of what people call type one phases in Haas code. You pay an energy penalty that grows with how far you've moved it. Uh, it's type two fractal phase. Okay, so that's you know, 
That's fractal and phase is by exactly solvable model. Um, exactly solvable models have the virtue of being exactly solvable. You can look at them, understand exactly what happens. Uh, they have the disadvantage that the models themselves are pretty baroque, uh, so it's hard to get a lot of intuition. So it's nice to have a complementary perspective. Uh, and the complementary perspective, which Michael Pretko identified, is given by gauge theories. Uh, so just a, a brief reminder, you will recall that in familiar gauge theories like electromagnetism, there's a Gauss law constraint, like div E equals rho. And this constraint implies a conservation law for charge. Because if you look at the charge in a volume, you can use the Gauss's law to turn this into the volume integral of div E. And now you can use the divergence theorem to turn this into a surface integral of the electric field. And so if you fix the electric field in the boundary, then you fix the charge inside the system. And so just by specifying the boundary condition, uh, you've ensured that the dynamics of the system must respect the constraint, and that constraint is charge conservation. Okay. Well, we know all this, and why am I bothering to belabor it? Well, we want to move away from familiar gauge theories to more unfamiliar gauge theories. Uh, the gauge theories with which we are familiar are written in terms of vector gauge fields. What if we wrote down a gauge theory in terms of tensor gauge fields? Well, if we wrote down gauge theories of anti-symmetric tensors, that's what's called you know, gauge theories of forms. Those have been studied. They don't do what we're looking for. Uh, what you want to write down is gauge theories involving symmetric tensors. Uh, so let's consider a gauge theory of symmetric tensors of you know, rank bigger than one. So rank two tensors is adequate for our purposes. Let's work in the continuum for simplicity. Let's assume U1 symmetry, again, for maximum simplicity. So there's an electric field, but now it's a rank two tensor, Eij. I want to write down a Gauss's law for the electric field. What does a Gauss's law look like? Well, it can't look like div, R, div E equals rho, because E has two indices, and div has only one. So the indices don't match. One possibility is I could do a two derivative Gauss's law, di dj eij equals rho. This is a possible Gauss law that I could write down, which defines a particular you know, higher rank gauge theory. This Gauss's law, well, it conserves charge, just like the old one, but it has an additional conserved quantity. Let's consider the dipole moment in a volume, x times rho, right? Volume integral of dipole moment. Now I can use Gauss's law to turn this into x times double derivative of e. I can integrate by parts once, and that turns it into, no, so one derivative kills the x, and I get single divergence of e. But this is still a divergence, so we can use divergence theorem to turn this into a purely surface integral. So if I fixed the electric field on the boundary, then not only have I fixed the charge in that volume, but I have also fixed the dipole moment in that volume. So once I've specified my boundary conditions, then only processes which conserve dipole moment are allowed. And this implies that charges must be fractals. Because if I had a charge Q and was sitting here, well, the state has some dipole moment. And if I move this charge over, now I have a different dipole moment, not allowed. Of course, if you have two charges, you can move them in some correlated fashion, which preserves dipole moment. That's OK. But that comes back to our statement that if you have multiple fractals close together, you can move them. But if they're well separated, there's no local operator that can move them, okay? because any local Move involving a single charge changes the dipole moment of the theory. This is one possible Gauss law you can write down. There's other generalized Gauss's laws which we could have written down, like this one. Uh, this constitutes a different sort of higher rank gauge theory. It leads to other constraints, things like subdimensional particles. But the key point is that you can reproduce the essential fraction phenomenology by writing down <coughs> gauge theories of higher rank uh, gauge fields. Okay, so just to summarize what fractons are, uh, they're new phases of matter. Uh, their characteristic property is that the excitations have fractionalized mobility. Uh, when they're gapped, there can be an enormous ground state degeneracy, uh, and a huge contribution, non-local contribution to entanglement entropy, which I didn't talk about. They can be understood in two complementary languages, exactly solvable lattice models and gauge theories of higher rank symmetric tensors. Uh, and now we're off to the races. Yeah? I don't understand. Is there a direct connection between the gauge theory description and the exactly solvable models? 
Uh, yes, there is. So there's two papers, one by Han Ma, uh, Xie Chen and Mike Hermely, and another by Danny Balmash and Mason Markeshley, where they explicitly spell out how you can get from the sort of gauge theory I wrote down uh, to one of the exactly solvable models, the X cube, typically. Uh, and it's a sequence of, you know, you start from the gauge, so, well, of course, the gauge theory is a U1 theory, those are Z2 theories, so there has to be a Higgs mechanism somewhere in there, so it's a sequence of Higgs transitions and partial confinement transitions, which will take you from one to the other. And you can also get Haas code and with more effort. Uh, there's something from, again, Bulmash and Barkeshli on that, and also something coming from like, my student, Albert Schmitz, uh, on getting Haas code from gauge theories. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, you know, so I, I already told you, the reason I got into fractons in the first place is because I think they're a nice playground for thinking about dynamics. So let's think about fracton dynamics. Uh, and for now, we'll start with the exactly solvable lattice models, X cube and Haas code, and we'll treat the dynamics using locator-ish methods, augmented by you know, stabilizer code techniques. I promised you I would go beyond locator expansions, and I will. But let's first see what locator expansions can give us, and then we'll go beyond locator expansions. So here is X cube. Uh, no, bare bones X cube model is just this, but this is in an atomic limit. It's like torque code. Uh, you make excitations that don't move because there's no hopping matrix element. So we'll consider X cube with arbitrary local perturbations. Uh, so it's not a, it's not localized for stupid you know, reasons that we were working in an atomic limit. I already told you that isolated fractons are completely immobile. And so you can show that if you have a vanishing density of fractons in your system, so if you had zero energy density, then those fractons can't move. So in some sense, it is a localized phase. It preserves the memory of its initial conditions in local observables for infinite times. So local observables being where are the unhappy cubes. But it's at zero energy density. It's a zero temperature thing. And for many body localization, we really want to be at non-zero energy density. So can we know what happens if we take these models and consider them at non-zero energy density? So uh, if we prepare them at non-zero energy density, let's say in a Gibbs state, there's some number of fractons, some number of mobile composites. It's still the case that the fractons cannot move without creating additional excitations. And creating additional excitations takes the system off energy shell. However, now there are mobile composite particles in the problem, and they can run around freely, and they can delocalize, and they constitute a heat path for the problem. So even though moving a fracton takes you off energy shell, you can borrow the missing energy from the bath of mobile composites, uh, and in this way get back on energy shell at some high order perturbation theory. The only problem is that taking you off energy shell, uh, that moving a fracton takes you off energy shell by an amount that's big, it's proportional to the gap in the model, and the amount of energy the bath can supply is small. It's proportional to the strength of the perturbations. So okay, so this is a you know, crappy bath, uh, but you know, there is still a bath in the problem. So you know, localized systems coupled to crappy baths is a problem that you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, in the many body localization context. So we'll just borrow those analyses. And they're essentially analyses of when a locator expansion breaks down, what length scale and what time scale. Uh, and you borrow those analyses and adapt, adapt them to fractons, and you conclude that the fractons should have a non-zero mobility, just that mobility will be exponentially small in temperature. So the mobility vanishes as temperature goes to zero, and it vanishes faster than any power law, it vanishes exponentially, uh, but you know, it's finite at any non-zero temperature. Uh, this is not just Arrhenius. Arrhenius is you have exponentially small conductivity because you have exponentially few carriers. That's still true here, but in addition, each carrier has a mobility that is exponentially small in temperature. You can also study the equilibration between the fractons and the bath. Uh, it's just a case of writing down rate equations between the different sectors. And you discover that the equilibration is extremely slow. It's logarithmic in time over some exponentially wide window of time scales. Uh, I haven't Going into too much detail of how we derived this, if you want to see it, go to the original paper. 
But what I did want to emphasize is that this has deep connections to classical glasses. So in the world of classical glasses, there's kinetically constrained models. Uh, so these are, you, know, you just write down some rules for what's allowed to happen. And those kinetically constrained models have rules which exhibit dynamical facilitation, uh, meaning one kind of excitation can only move if another kind of excitation is close to it. I think the most famous such uh, models are the Friedrichsen Anderson models. Anderson in this case is not Phil, it's HC Anderson, and HC really stands for Hans Christian, uh, although not the guy who wrote the Steadfast Tin Soldier, but somebody else with the same name. Uh, also, his last name is spelled differently. It's Andersen, S-E-N. Okay, uh, but there are these kinetically constrained models, and these are known to exhibit glassy dynamics uh, and logarithmic in time relaxation. And the dynamical rules that we derive from the fractons are identical to the dynamical rules of the Friedrichsen-Anderson models uh, from kinetically constrained classical glasses. It's just that in the Friedrichsen-Anderson models, you write down those rules by hand. And here they emerge from Hamiltonian dynamics. But they're the same rules, same dynamical rules, and so you should expect to get the same behavior, logarithmic in time relaxation and glassy dynamics. Okay, that was house code, oh, X cube. Now let's consider house code. More complicated model. The key like, important difference is that the in X cube, every time you moved a fracton, you paid a constant energy penalty. So you had to borrow the same amount of energy from the path. In Haas code, the energy penalty grows with every additional step you make. So you have to borrow more and more energy from the path every time you move a fracton. Uh, as a consequence of that, it turns out, so actually, no, I just stated the result here, but we can derive it. Why not? So in x cubed, the mobility went as x minus w over t, or the rate at which fractons moved went like this. Uh, now w is itself a function of distance, so it's w naught log r. Energy barrier grows logarithmically with how far you move. And this tells me that the rate at which fractons move, if I turn this around, it goes like r to the power uh, minus w over t, and rate is like 1 over time. So if I turn this around, ah, oh, there I go. So no, t goes like r to the w over t, or equivalently, distance goes like t time to the power of temperature over gap scale. So at small temperatures, this is extreme subdiffusion. Right? R goes like t to the one half would be diffusion. This is arbitrarily slower than diffusion. But you know, this log R behavior is only true up to the typical spacing between fractons. So it's extreme subdiffusion up to some length scale where the fractons find each other and become mobile composites, and thereafter it should be diffusion. But up to some long time scale, there's subdiffusive relaxation. Uh, you can estimate the time scale up to which there is subdiffusive relaxation. Uh, again, it follows from here, really. So, uh, right. so now if I say that I'm at low temperature, so the fractons are exponentially far apart. If they're exponentially far apart, then log of exponential gives me another factor of 1 over t. So we get behavior that looks like x minus a relaxation rate, which is x minus 1 over t squared. So now the relaxation is super Arrhenius slope. Uh, the relaxation rate vanishes faster than any exponential function of temperature as temperature goes to zero, but it's still finite at any non-zero temperature. Okay. So, fracton models are natural translationally invariant models which exhibit glassy dynamics. The approach to equilibrium is logarithmic in time. The fracton mobility is suppressed, potentially super exponentially so. There could be subdiffusion up to times potentially super exponentially long in temperature. Uh, so what I showed you so far was for Hauss Z2 code. There's also Hauss U1 code. 
in which the energy barriers grow exponentially with distance. So if I did the same thing for Hausdi 1 code, uh, my relaxation time, instead of being exponential in 1 over t squared, it would be x puff x puff x puff 1 over t. Uh, so you know, triple exponential uh, is basically infinite, but it's not really. It's really, for practical purposes, triple exponential could, you know, is longer than any reasonable scale, but you know, for a purist, even triple exponential is still finite, so it's not really many body localization, but it's glossy. You can get it as glossy as you want. Uh, you can have ultra glossy behavior. But the relaxation time, while long, is never infinite. Okay, uh, this was still all based on locator expansions. I promised we'd go beyond locator, and that's what I'll do next. But before I do that, any questions about what we did so far? Okay. So to go beyond locator, I need to bring in ideas from yet one more field, uh, and that's the field of random circuit dynamics, which has also been pretty active in recent years. Adam Nahum has uh, written a beautiful series of papers on the topic. And the idea here is you have some quantum state, you act on it with some sequence of randomly of local gates, which are randomly chosen from some distribution, and you talk about the dynamics. So this is a model for quantum dynamics. Now, Hamiltonian dynamics can always be viewed in this way, right? Because you have a Hamiltonian time evolution by a local Hamiltonian. You have some unitary operator, e to the iht, you could trotterize it and now think of it as some sequence of gates acting on the system. But Hamiltonian time evolution does not involve random gates at every step. If you choose random gates at every step, that's like you have Hamiltonian time evolution with a Hamiltonian which randomly changes in time. And if you have a stochastic Hamiltonian like that, you don't have any energy conservation. Energy conservation is tied to time translation symmetry. So, no, random circuit dynamics is even less constrained than Hamiltonian dynamics because there's no energy conservation in the problem. So it's a minimally structured model for quantum dynamics. Uh, and it's a minimally structured model which is readily tractable both analytically by the method of Haar averages uh, and numerically. And generically it leads to chaos and ergodicity and you can come up with beautifully detailed descriptions of chaos and ergodicity. If you restore some kind of energy conservation, if you do Floquet, for instance, and you make your unitary periodic in time, then you can get non-regardic phases. But as far as I know, if you have a completely random circuit with no time translation symmetry, the only thing people ever find is ergodic behavior. Okay. And one way you could understand this is if you don't have any energy conservation, you don't have any locator expansion. What's delta E that sits in the denominator? It doesn't make sense. There's no conserved energy. Okay, so that's pure random circuits. You could also imagine constrained random circuits. So there was a couple of papers, one by Vedika Kemani and all, and one by Kurt von Kaiserlink. So you know, Vedika was a student here, Kurt was a postdoc here. Again, good Princeton connections. Uh, and uh, you know, what they did is they considered a random circuit which was constrained to conserve a U1 charge. Okay. So in, that, in their case, it was total SC. So if you have a random circuit, then the gates must conserve a local U1 charge. And if you impose U1 charge conservation, you still find ergodicity, but now you also find diffusion. So you act with, you know, you have a conserved U1 charge, you act with random gates, that charge executes a random walk, you get diffusion. And you can have a beautifully detailed kind of derivation of diffusion in a many body system. But that still doesn't do what we want. We want localization or non-ergodicity. Uh, so we want a different kind of constraint. And while I spent all of that time introducing fractons for a reason, we want a fractonic constraint. What do I mean by a fractonic constraint? Well, I showed you already that the key property behind fractons comes about because of the existence of higher moment conservation laws. Right? Conservation laws on dipole moment, let's say. So let's impose a dipole moment conservation. We'll consider a spin chain undergoing random circuit dynamics the random circuit will be constrained to conserve a U1 charge and also the dipole moment of that charge. So just pictorially, you have some random circuit and it's constrained to 
obey that will run it and charge conservation. What do I mean? Well, it's easiest to implement this for a system of spin ones, because if you do it with spin ones, then you can get away with just three side gates. If you wanted spin halves, you would have to do four or five side gates. Uh, so for spin, uh, for spin ones, you can have gates made up of ones and zs. Those are just phases. But the non-trivial gates made of x's and minuses have these possible allowed transitions. Uh, so you know, in different sectors, in the sector with net charge zero, if you the allow three cutered gates are this, you can take a single dipole and you can move it over, or you can take plus minus plus and you can turn it into zero plus zero. So if you like, you can take a single fracton, you can hop it over one site at the cost of pushing you know, a dipole out at the other end. You can move a fracton by emitting a dipole. If you consider also four cutered gates, there is many more possibilities, and you can also consider five cutered gates, and we did. Uh, but you know, the basic idea is that you're constrained to consider dipole moment. So your charges can move, but they can only move by emitting dipoles. So a charge moves, you emit a dipole, you preserve the overall charge and dipole moment of the state. Now let's consider what the circuit does. So first we'll consider a pure dipole initial condition. So an initial condition which contains a single dipole and zeros everywhere else. Uh, so a dipole can move freely. I mean, a dipole is just a U1 conserved quantity. If I conserve charge in the dipole moment, but not the quadrupole moment, then dipole moment is a U1 conserved charge. So if I look at the dynamics of an initial state containing just dipoles, then I should expect to find diffusion. And indeed we do, it's diffusion and it maps exactly onto the earlier analyses of diffusion with a conserved U1 charge. The interesting physics arises if you consider an initial condition which contains a fracton. So zeros and then one charge stuck in somewhere. So remember this is random circuit dynamics. There's no conserved energy and so there's nothing like a locator expansion. There are gates which move fractons around. Remember, you can move charges by emitting a dipole. So you know, if you had a charge over here, you could move it one unit to the right by spitting out a dipole, and this dipole could then diffuse and go away, and you'd be left with the fracton having moved over from the second side to the third side. That's allowed. In fact, there exist sequences of gates that will move the charge to absolutely anywhere in the system that you want it to go. So there is no <coughs> locator expansion. There exist processes, perturbation theory, that take your charge absolutely anywhere in the system. Nevertheless, you look at what random circuit does. You can average, average over many uh, realizations of the random circuit if you want. And you find that this is what happens to the charge distribution. Time zero, time three, time 10, 16, 200. Charge stays in the same place. You can also look at varying system sizes, 12, 15, 18, 21, and you can see that in fact, no. even as you make the system larger and larger, the charge doesn't seem to move. In fact, it only gets better localized. If you look at the fraction of the charge that stays close to the origin, it actually increases slightly as you increase system size. Uh, so here's a problem where there's no locator expansion, no conserved energy even, and yet, it seems like the charge doesn't move under local quantum dynamics. Yeah? This is with open boundary conditions? This is with open boundary conditions. Well, this is with open boundary conditions, but the same behavior is also observed with periodic boundary conditions. <laughs> so, what's going on? Well, what's going on is the following. Remember I told you charges can move, but only at the expense of spitting out a fracton, oh, spitting out a dipole, right? So I can take a charge, and I can move it here by spitting out a dipole, which can then move. But this move is only permanent 
if the dipole you know, stays away. Because you, know, you can do this, but you can also go back there. Okay. So under Riemann circuit dynamics, you can move to here, and then you can act with the additional gates, which move the dipole off. That's fine. That's left you with a single charge that's moved over. But if the dipole ever comes back, then you can just undo the original move, and you're back to the charge being in its original position. What is the dipole doing? Well, the dipole is a conserved charge, which can be moved around by random gates that act on it. So it's executing a random walk. It's diffusing. But this dipole is diffusing in one dimension. And random walks in one dimension always return to the origin. Random walks in two dimensions always return to the origin. Uh, it's the standard result, but you can get it from, if you have the diffusion propagator, so the diffusion propagator is x minus x squared over 2 dt, and then there's the overall normalization, 1 over dt with some pi factors to the d, and this is the Green's function for diffusion. Uh, and now you evaluate the Green's function x and t, you evaluate the Green's function at x equals 0 and t for return to the origin, integrate over all time, and you get this expression here. So if x is 0, the exponential goes away. You're just left with 1 over t to the power d half integrated over time. That goes like t to the power 1 minus d over 2. If d is 1, then this is t to the 1 half, where t is how long you've waited. If you take t to infinity, this blows up. Tells you you return to the origin an infinite number of times in one dimension. In two dimensions, like this crude argument is marginal, but actually there's still a divergence. It's a logarithmic in time divergence. Uh, and so in one and two dimensions, diffusion always returns to the origin. In fact, it returns to the origin an infinite number of times. And in consequence, there are no permanent moves for the fracton. You can move a charge by spinning out a dipole and having that dipole wander off, but that's only temporary because pretty soon the dipole will come back. And then your charge off will be undone and you'll be back to the original position. And the end result is that charges are localized near their original position. Uh, and this is localization which does not follow from locator expansion, but rather it follows from the return probabilities of low dimensional random walks. Now those of you that are expert in single particle localization will recognize that this looks an awful lot like weak localization. So there is this phenomenon which I didn't talk about. So, there is one prior example of localization without locator expansions, and that's the phenomenon of weak localization in low dimensions in single particle physics. Uh, that's something I didn't really talk about, but it's this classic paper of Abrahams, uh, Anderson, Bichardello, and Ramakrishnan. I think at the time they were all at Princeton uh, in 1970 something, uh, which introduces weak localization theory. And weak localization, again, is all about the return probabilities of random walks in low dimensions. It operates in dimensions you know, one and two. Uh, but weak localization is sensitive to dephasing. So if you introduce a magnetic field, it spoils weak localization. If you introduce arbitrary phases caused by interaction with other particles, it spoils weak localization. You need the particle to come back and to come back in a phase coherent manner without having accumulated any additional unwanted phases. What the fractonic structure did for us is it removed the sensitivity to dephasing. All you care about is that the dipole comes back. You don't care what phase it comes back with. So because you no longer care about the phase uh, of the dipole, you can now adapt essentially weak localization arguments to the many body setting. The reason previously we couldn't adapt weak localization arguments to the many body setting is you have a single electron that's diffusing around and it interacts with some other electron, it picks up a random phase. Even if it comes back to the origin, it does not come back to the origin in a phase coherent way. It doesn't come back with the same phase. Weak localization doesn't work. But now, because of the fractonic structure, we don't care about the phase with which it comes back. All we care about is that it returns. It's still true that random walks in dimensions one and two always return to the origin. And therefore, it follows that we still have localization in this fractonic constraint circuit. 
which manifestly doesn't have anything like a locator expansion. Uh, we can derive very detailed predictions for the dynamics, including you know, those of non-conserved operators, and we find you know, beautiful agreement with numerics. If you want to see all of that, you know, go look at our paper, preprint from last month. And it suggests that there should that a single fractal operating under random circuit dynamics, or more strictly, it suggests that random circuit dynamics with dipole moment conservation should exhibit charge conservation in dimensions one and two, but not in three dimensions, because three-dimensional random walks do not have to return to the origin. So in three dimensions, you emit a dipole, and the dipole could just go off forever, and then you have a permanent move. Okay? So it suggests that low-dimensional systems could actually be special. Uh, but now two dimensions is also considered low dimensional, not just one dimension. Uh, you can also look at the entanglement entropy. So if you look without dipole moment conservation, uh, then as you sweep the partition point, the entanglement entropy increases. This is meant to indicate volume loss scaling. But once you impose a dipole moment conservation constraint, you find that the entanglement entropy is uh, at, in the late time state is independent of where you make the partition. So you have essentially area law entanglement uh, in this, in the late time state. We can't talk about eigenstates because there's no conserved energy, but there's just the state to which you go at different times, and that state has area law entanglement when you impose dipole moment conservation instead of volume law. So you have lines and dash lines. Dash lines are without dipole moment conservation, solid are with dipole moment conservation. So, so far, I considered initial conditions with a single fracton. What if you have multiple fractons? Well, if you have multiple charges in your initial condition, then dipoles emitted by one can be absorbed by the other. So they can be permanent moves. Okay? You move one charge, spit out a dipole, and that dipole goes and gets absorbed by a different charge. So now the fractons can move. They have a diffusion constant. And that diffusion constant depends on the separation between them. It's inversely proportional to the square separation between them. You can check it, numerically, it works. This is supposed to illustrate that. So, uh, yeah. You can localize them two sites away, and the diffusion constant is like one quarter. Four sites away, it's like one sixteenth. Uh, six sites away, it's like one thirty sixth. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Are you using numerics here to justify an argument or to visualize something that's been proven more rigorously? I am using numerics to check an argument. Okay. So you know, the basic picture is that uh, fractal motion is coupled to dipole density, which obeys hydrodynamic equations. And you can write down phenomenological hydrodynamics, which is just a, a mobile particle coupled to a hydrodynamic density. And every move creates charge density or absorbs charge density. And now you can, you know, from this phenomenological hydrodynamics, you can derive predictions. And you can check those predictions against numerics. And the agreement is perfect. Uh, however, even though the fractons can diffuse, the final state is still non-ergodic. Why is it non-ergodic? Well, fractons can diffuse by exchanging dipoles. They can exchange dipoles more effectively if they're close together. Their diffusion constant increases rapidly as they get close together. Okay? So fractons want to all be close together because then they can move about more freely. They experience an effective attraction. You move them close together, and they can move more easily. You move them far apart, and they can't move so easily. So it, it's a random walk that's biased towards having them come together. And so what you have is that the dynamics takes the system to a final state where the fractons all agglomerate at their center of charge. And this is still a monergotic final state. So uh, fractons to localization. Fractonic circuits have shown us a new way to get localization without relying on locator expansion. And it works in one and two dimensional systems with dipole moment conservation constraints. So far, we've only uh, looked at this in <coughs> random circuit dynamics. Uh, we would like to generalize it also to Hamiltonian dynamics in low dimensions. I think something like you know, localization should follow, because if you go from random circuit dynamics to Hamiltonian dynamics, then you have impose an additional constraint, energy conservation. And imposing an additional constraint should only make things more localized, but it you know, remains to actually be shown. Uh, 
Uh, also, no, so far, I just wrote down a circuit which had dapple moment conservation you know, imposed by hand. How could this arise in a realistic system? Well, one way would be to actually have a fraction phase in two dimensions or one dimension. Uh, we don't know how to get a lattice model of fractons in two dimensions. There are field theories that do it. We also don't know if 1D fracton phases exist at all as stable phases. I mean, maybe they do. Uh, another possibility is you could use you know, some other kind of fanciness. So for instance, you could consider a system in a strong electric field. Uh, if you put a system in a strong electric field, then you move a charge, it changes the dipole moment, that changes the energy by a lot. Right? Because the dipole moment couples directly to the electric field. So just applying a big electric field across a 1D system could give you something like a dipole moment cons uh, conservation as well. Now, just last week, there were a couple of numerical papers, one by Gil Raphael and co-workers, and one by Frank Pullman and co-workers, which both considered 1D systems with a big electric field across them and no disorder, and they appeared to see localization. Now, now they had a different interpretation in terms of 1E start ladders, but I think now, some of the same dipole moment conservation physics that I was talking about may also be going on there. So now, there's things to investigate there. This chapter has only begun. Various people involved in the fracton work. Abhinav Prem, who was a student in Boulder and is now, is he in the audience? Well, the postdoc with an office down there. Uh, Zhang Wan Ha from Microsoft. Michael Pretko, postdoc at Boulder. And Shriya Pai, student at Boulder. Uh, and with that, well, I still have 15 minutes, but I've said whatever I wanted to say. So maybe I'll just take questions. You're saying in the case when you have more than one fracton in your system, they're going to drift towards each other? Mm -hmm. Well, once they meet up, don't you lose? Because then they can <coughs> move around freely. Uh, Right, so the things that can move around freely are charge neutral combinations of fractons. So of course, in models like X cubed and house code, which I had introduced earlier, the conservation law was Z2. So if you take two fractons and put them together, you can get something trivial, or actually it's four fractons and put them together, you get something trivial. But what we're dealing with now are U1 models. So you have to put a fracton and an anti-fracton together, right? So let's say we're in some sector with non-zero total charge. They all agglomerate, you're left with a fracton in the middle. And that's uh, an immobile object. Or you're left with some non zero charge in the middle. If you start from an initial state which is in the zero charge sector, then yes, they all come together, they all cancel, you're left with no fractonic charge, uh, and then there's nothing non regardic left in the problem them in pairs or some number that's charge neutral, right? Uh, well, I imagine. Yeah, you, so you take one. one of them and or you know, some number of fractons and you move them off to infinity, oh, and then you look at the dynamics of the rest of the system. I mean, you could make the same complaint about electric charges, right? What do you mean, the finite charge sector? Uh, electric charges always come in pairs. I don't know, maybe the universe has neck electric charge, but. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> these, uh, these fracton phases, they are themselves uh, topologically protected? What do you mean? So the following statement is true. If you consider the gap fracton phases, for example, the different ground states uh, are, so any local operator has zero matrix element between the different ground states, and the excited states are gapped. So it follows that no local perturbation can do anything dramatic. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, and I guess you can just have an extra 10 minutes to your coffee break, we'll conclude.
Ini Yeah, exactly. Because I don't know what the time. You want to summon the afterwards. That's the only safe thing I can say. It's just like this. Oh, yeah. It's for this. Even this day? Is it easy to extract from this distance? That's like that's the analog of the execute of two. That's the analog of this pocket Isaac. Three D three D cube cubic lattice. You have the attractions on a base. This is the pocket Isaac. This is three D. If you gauge that, what's what's the substance? Of course, you put every spin in a plane. Yeah. If you gauge this, you get a higher. That's right. Now we're trying to figure it out. In 2D, you have this. Ah, so so you you yeah. 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 If you gauge it, you get the same model back. You get like more of the new theory. So it's not fractal. There's no graph state to generate. There, there is, is but it's, yeah, but it's, not, it's not topological. What about these uh, models like that Yoshida wrote down where you have some oh, fractal okay. symmetry? <laughs> right, so in that case... <laughs> It's done the same thing. The fractal symmetry, the fractal symmetry models, the spontaneous break symmetry, and that, that's what causes the graph to so be global symmetry? It's fractal, fractal symmetry. It's spontaneous yeah. break. No fractal symmetry. His construction is that if you go into 3D, then you can have fractal symmetries in this case, and then you run. It's basically it is a fraction. 
but he doesn't mention it. Well, he doesn't mention that it comes from having a 3D system with some practice and he's engaging it and then you get this model. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there is there a clear equivalence class of fractal changes or subsystems? Um, that's exactly what I. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on right now. Yeah. Um, in 2D, and 1D subsystems, and it's oh, yeah. like the simplest. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 I mean, not, not the same class. Yeah. 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 Kevin Slagle yeah. and yeah. Yeah. the student. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, they have this concept of foliated fracton phases. Which is go from one to another by adding layers of followed by local unitary operator. So like general yeah. It allows you to, you to yeah, yeah. So in that sense, they showed that like pretty much all fracton models fall into a few categories, which is type one, type two. Uh, all type one fracton phases fall into a few equivalence classes, and there's like X cube, and there's like two X cube, and there's like. I mean, two X like so there's, there's two, two, yeah, two, yeah, two, you put two of them like uh, into uh, on top of each other, okay. and then like the checkerboard model um, is this, this other fracton model. That they show that the checkerboard is equivalent to two fracton, two X cube models stacked on top of each other, and like so. Those are the two, and then there's also like. There's like different fractal models with different foliation numbers, so like X cube is 